our panel here, uh, I wouldn't uh, claim so much to know all of them, but uh, I mean uh, a lot of detail about them, but uh, they are upcoming um, archaeologists, scholars of archaeology. I, I want to say that um, uh, probably a number of us inside this room are beginning to appreciate archaeology as a, um, uh, not uh, a sub just a subject, but uh, as a, a very serious uh, area of scholarly inquiry and uh, practice. But also uh, to realize that um, important as it is, uh, hitherto it is uh, foreign dominated. Much of the archaeological knowledge that uh, um, we use in teaching, in research, in uh, field work is, um, um, has been over the years produced by uh, uh, outsiders. In the last um, Uh, ten years or so, this has been changing very fast, and that's why we have a very distinguished panel here of uh, archaeologists that are based in Makerere. And um, so uh, each uh, presenter will be introducing themselves briefly. And uh, so we are starting with Tendai Zehovi. I'm told Tendai is online. Tendai, I hope you are getting me. Uh, so mm -hmm. get online and uh, please uh, give us your presentation. The power of archaeological heritage in building national identity. The case of Great Zimbabwe World Heritage Site, 18... 1920, 22. Um, Hello, thank you so much, Dr. Tabajuka. I hope I'm so clear. Am I clear? Can you hear me? Yes, please. Yes, you are clear. I hope uh, you are getting Tendai in the room. I'm trying to share my presentation uh, because there are certain pictures which I have to show. I don't know how to do this. Okay. Mm. All right, I've been trying to share my screen, but it's not coming out. So let me just get in. It's not there. All right, so I'm going to talk about an archaeological site uh, which has been uh, successfully been nationalized. This is a great Zimbabwe well dated site, and uh, it has been used for uh, national identity, for building national identity. And uh, the site has actually been uh, abused and used uh, during the colonial period and in the post colonial period. So, this is my uh, PhD topic, and I'm going to look at uh, the, my topic is the power of archaeological heritage in building national identity. And I'm fo focusing on Great Zimbabwe World Heritage Property. And I'm focusing on the period 1890 to 2022. So uh, imagines of heritage is closely tied uh, to the histories of European nationalism in the 19th century. And uh, European countries such as Greece, Norway, Germany, among other nations, have been using archaeological heritage in building national identity. So this issue of uh, nationness and heritage have always been linked uh, since the 19th century. And uh, we see this extending to the once colonized states in Africa and in Asia. And in Africa in particular, uh, this concept of heritage uh, has been imposed on these nations where we see certain values being attached to the heritage. We see values such as aesthetic, scientific, economic, 
being attached to their heritage. And we also see this heritage being given some status, like uh, national monument status, world heritage site status. Western nations have also imposed uh, some uh, universal laws of managing and conserving these laws. So this kind of authorized heritage discourse, we can see it in the archeological site of Great Zimbabwe. And uh, Great Zimbabwe has been influential in the building of uh, national identity. So I'm going to look at three different periods in which it was used for building national identity and for political reasons. But before I do that, let me explain what Great Zimbabwe is. Great Zimbabwe is a dry stone old structure, which means it was built without the use of mortar. So it is divided into three architectural components, which are hill complex, great enclosure, and valley enclosures. So these three areas, they sprawl across 50 hectares. But the World Heritage Site, the World World Heritage Site property, it sprawls across 722 hectares. And uh, within these 722 hectares, uh, other dressed structures like um, Chenga ruins and MJJJ ruins. So uh, Great Zimbabwe has been used uh, for building national identity since the colonial, for building national identity since the colonial period. And uh, when Europeans came to Zimbabwe, they were concerned about finding now. Uh, this is when they... Um. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, so uh, when Europeans came to Zimbabwe, they used the Great Zimbabwe to justify the colonization of Zimbabwe, of uh, Zimbabwe, and um, they were concerned about finding who the original builders of the site were, and they attributed the site to foreign origin. And uh, this is when they started to apply their Western values to the site. For instance, when they declared the site a national monument in 1937, they also started to use uh, some of the local products like the Zimbabwe bed. The Zimbabwe bed was used by the local people for religious purposes, uh, but uh, they used this as a symbol of their government, the Rhodesian government. And uh, you find that during the colonial period, Africans have also been using the site, for, uh, but they were using this for ritual ceremonies. And this began in the 1960s with the formation of nationalist parties. So nationalists, uh, these nationalist parties which were formed as ANU and ZAPU. So nationalists have been going to the site secretly uh, since they were not allowed to be at the site. But before the colonial period, you find that Africans have been using the site for rainmaking and Thanksgiving ceremonies. And um, the site is also important to Zimbabweans because it is home to their uh, ancestral spirits. So nationalists have been going there because they wanted to do rituals, they wanted to seek intervention of the ancestral spirits so that they would be guided in fighting against the liberation struggle. So with the attainment of independence in 1980, this is where we start to see uh, differences in which the site was used for building national identity and uh, where the newborn nation was used uh, for building national identity. Uh, where the name of the site, Zimbabwe, of the name of the site was given to the country, the name is Zimbabwe, meaning big house of stones. So we also see some of the archaeological features being used um, in building national identity as symbols of national identity. We see features such as the Zimbabwe bed and uh, the conical tower being used as symbols of national identity. The Zimbabwe bed appears on the national flag and national coat of arms. The conical tower, it is used as a symbol of the revolutionary parties and PF. And it also appears as a, it also appears on the national coat of arms and it also appears as a backdrop for Zimbabwe broadcasting cooperation news. So after independence and post-independent period, this is where we start to see the differences in which the site was used for building national identity. This was, uh, it was now used more for commercial purposes, but this began in the year 2000 with uh, when uh, Western countries imposed sanctions on the government of Zimbabwe over the redistribution of land to black Zimbabweans. So with these sanctions, the economy of the country uh, declined to unprecedented levels. This is where we start to see the differences an increase in the adoption of the name of the site uh, by institutions, hotels, and universities. 
And this was done in order to market these places using the household name Great Zimbabwe. We also see an increase uh, in the use of the site for ritual ceremonies by politicians, uh, by business people in Pentecostal churches. And this was done in order to seek powers from the site. Businessmen and uh, business people who have been seeking powers to attract people to their businesses. And uh, Pentecostal and Apostolic churches have been uh, seeking powers to attract people to their churches. Maybe they wanted more tithes. And um, we also see an increase in the adoption of the architectural motifs at the site, particularly the Great Enclosure and the Concord Tower. And this was adopted by the hotels, the lodges, and this was done in order to market these places. But what is really the problem with the adoption of the name of the site? You'd find that uh, there's now a competition. The name is now more identified with the Great Zimbabwe Hotel, Great Zimbabwe University, and all other places which have adopted the name than, this, than the site itself. So this actually has implications on the identity of the site. And uh, when it comes also to the adoption of the architectural motifs at the site, you find that there's always um, there's some, there are imitations of the Concord Tower and the Great Enclosure almost everywhere in the country. But considering that this site is a national shrine, it is important to understand. Will you wind up in uh, the next five minutes? All right. It is important to understand whether it is appropriate for these uh, architectural motifs to be uh, imitated almost everywhere in the country. And also this, when the site was accorded a well-dated site, it was accorded uh, based on three criteria, which are criterion one, criterion three, and criterion six. Criterion one is the one which I'm actually interested in, in this particular thing on uh, architectural motifs, which says it represents a masterpiece of human creative genius. So um, the attributes that we find in this criterion are the great enclosure, the conquer tower, and, um, and uh, other dry stone structures and uh, archaeological features found in the site. So it is also important to understand whether it is appropriate, what implications do these adoptions have on the, on the identity and uniqueness of the site. And when it comes to ritual ceremonies, you find that uh, whenever Pentecostals and Apostolic churches come for their rituals, there's always a vote fire which occurs within the monument. And uh, these vote fires, they destroy the archeological features at the site. So this, uh, you because maybe they would have angered their ancestral spirits. So every time these people come, there's always a good fire which destroys archaeological features within the monument. And uh, spirit mediums also, when they come, they demand that some of the darker structures they decide to be destroyed. Uh, they say there's something which was planted by uh, colonialists during the colonial period, which is causing the socioeconomic challenges that the country is currently facing. So they demand that these structures be destroyed. But at the same time, you find that uh, curators at the site want these uh, data structures to be conserved because this is evidence supports the idea that the site was built by Africans. And uh, when uh, uh, people come for their rituals, they stage their ritual objects within the walls. The walls that are the nature of walls that I create in Zimbabwe is that they are freestanding. So they are two outer walls, and in between they score. So what happens is people they remove the core and place their ritual objects like coffins, like clay pots, and other ritual objects. And this destabilizes walls, causing the eventual collapse of walls. Do I have how many minutes am I left with? So I want to understand. Um. Uh, go on, go ahead and uh, try to okay. wind up. All right. So I want to understand the issues that have shaped the way the site has been used for political reasons and also to find the factors that have influenced the uh, Zimbabwe construction industry and hotels to use the site for commercial purposes and also to document how the site has been used and abused. Um, then uh, for the research methods, I think I'm going to use the same structured interviews and I'll interview a number of people, spirit mediums, um, national museums and monuments of Zimbabwe staff. Uh, then uh, we have also focus group discussions with uh, great Zimbabwe staff in the national museums and monuments staff. 
I thank you, Dr. Indang Yawong. Yeah, thank you, thank you very, very much, Jendai. Uh, um, so uh, keep your questions, uh, um, the audience. Um, we'll take all the um, presentations, listen to them, and then uh, after which uh, we'll have uh, um, our questions and comments at all the uh, um, panelists at uh, go. Next, uh, can we have uh, Albert uh, Samuel? Albert Samuel, uh, give, uh, uh, so? Uh, Samuel has um, a PowerPoint presentation. Um, but uh, in the meantime, you can give a brief uh, introduction about yourself. Um, Samuel is presenting on um, the carriage of uh, Megal's culture in the Lake Eyas Basin, northern Tanzania. Okay, thank you, Chair. Good afternoon, all. My name is Albert Samuel, a PhD student in the Department of History, Archaeology and Heritage Studies in Makerere, and uh, a beneficiary of Geda Henkel Steve Tang as a, my founder. Uh, to start with, maybe defining key terms, because my title is at the Archaeology of Megalith Culture in the Lake Yas Bethin, North, Northern Tanzania. Uh, to start maybe by defining the word uh, megalith, it's a construction between two words, which is mega and a leith. Mega means big, and, uh, and a leith means stones. So it's uh, big stones. And uh, it is uh, conceptually a construction by using uh, big stones. And it's, uh, it's been a culture which has existed uh, from around the, the Neolithic time up to present. Uh, so, ma, this study will be carried out at uh, uh, Lake Yas Basin, which is uh, in Mangora, Karatu, in northern Tanzania. Lake Yas is uh, one of the largest uh, uh, water bodies in, 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 in Arusha region and it lies in the flow of the great East African Rift Valley system in the branch of Eyas Wembele branch of, of the Great Rift Valley. Uh, and uh, this region, it is a, a region which is archaeologically like in, uh, exhaustively researched by, by different scholars because it has contributed a lot in the understanding of Pleistocene and the Holocene archaeology of East Africa, but also it has been used as an area of testing the paleo-environmental model of East Africa, like associating the paleo-environmental history with the human culture of the region. And on top of that, the region the region, where talking to human inhabitations or human activities can be traced from around 300 years ago up to present. And having said that, it is represented by Middle Stone Age culture, but also LSA culture, which is the later Stone Age culture, but also there is also existence of pastoral Neolithic culture, which is a time when he thought uh, production of or food production was was introduced in the region. So Neolithic means production or the origin of production of of, of food crops and pastoralism. So saying that these records 
and the, and the culture that I've mentioned played this region into a, a very unique position in the study of human biological and the cultural and the cultural and, 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 and the cultural evolution. But also, uh, previous scholars also have been uh, have been uh, have been uh, revealing or reporting the existence of megalithic structures. But for them, they are just reporting as structures. But for conceptualization of this study, I'm thinking it as a megalithic culture. That's why I'm just bringing it up with, uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a megalithic culture. However, there are much of these structures or this culture I'm talking about, which is, a, it, which is, is not known. For instance, the age or the time for the construction of these structures, but also subsistence economy of the people, but also people who constructed the megalithic are not known in this particular region, but also uh, the, what influenced them to construct. And here I'm just referring to the environment that influenced or that persisted during that particular time. But, uh, but uh, among also these researchers, we also see some researchers that are associating this site with uh, one of the other prominent sites in Tanzania, which is of late Stone Age culture. But uh, still, this culture, which is Engaruka, Stone Age, like late Stone Age culture, but uh, Engaruka also presents like uh, uh, chronological contradictions because what we used to know about the timing of Engaruka, uh, recently we are receiving like uh, late ages or like, like, like chron late chron chronologies of, of, of Engaruka. Uh, from being a late stone age site into being a Neolithic, a Neolithic site. And, uh, and uh, on top of that, a recent study done by Mouton Desar, 2021, uh, it is uh, presenting the materials that connect this site, well, like like S. Bezin, to a Neolithic site. So that brings contradiction. That's why I, I thought of of, of conducting now a detailed study, uh, archaeologically to reconstruct the culture, specifically by, 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 by examining the setting and the nature of the megalithic structures in Lake Yasbezin, but also to characterize the archaeological assemblages associated with the megalithic structures in Lake Yasbezin. And uh, thirdly, is to establish the relative and uh, absolute chronology or time of the megalithic and finally, to examine the environment that characterizes the technological development associated with megalithic culture. In terms of the, of the theory, this study will be hinged with two theories, which is theory of environmental possibilism and the refugium theory. And uh, uh, specifically, refugium theory advocates environment to be the main influence of human behavior or of human advancement. So I'm using this theory to check on whether the environment and its dynamics, especially instabilities, how it influenced the, 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 the erection of megalithic structures, but also influenced what is composed within the, uh, the megalithic, megalithic, megalithic site. But also, when it comes to theory of environmental possibilism, I'm um, specifically, uh, specifically stressing on human uh, choices regardless of what the environment can provide to them. That uh, however much the environment can, can, can influence a, a, a particular kind of, of advancement or change, but still human beings have the choice and, and the options of how they can cope with that environment. And uh, for instance, there is an environment where maybe it favors the, the, the cultivation of, of, of matoke, but still you can find people who are not cultivating matoke under that particular, particular environment. They, they can even select to cultivate cassava instead of matoke. Uh, in case of research design, I'm thinking of employing uh, both qualitative and uh, quantitative research approach because uh, I, will be, uh, I will be focusing on uh, verifying the existing truth, which is uh, 
uh, persisting from the uh, megalithic structure in the Reykjavik basin, but in, in case of qualitative, it will be just to interpret uh, the data in relation to human, in, to human behavior. And uh, uh, for the sampling, I will uh, employ both uh, probabilistic and non-probabilistic -prob sampling, but uh, for probabilistic, it will specifically be for doing surveys and selecting areas to, to carry out the uh, archaeological excavations. But for non-probabilistic, it will be specifically for selecting sites for, for, for carrying out the archaeological excavations, but also for areas to collect uh, the environmental proxy data. In case of uh, primary data collection methods, like uh, the study uh, will employ both secondary and, 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 and the primary data. And for, for the primary data, the methods will employ archaeological surveys, uh, also archaeological excavations, which is systematic digging to retrieve materials. But also, I will use archaeological archive, specifically from the National Museum of Tanzania, and uh, the archive of, from the University of Dar es Salaam repository. But also, collection of environmental proxies, and here it is specifically phytolith. These are uh, microbotanic, uh, uh, microbotanic remains that can survive long in the sediments, and because they have uh, uh, that characteristic of surviving long, they will be used to reconstruct the past environment and, uh, and uh, for the purpose of inferring what influenced those people, but also helping to understand the, the human behavior or human selection of the plants communities, but also uh, and how prehistoric and historic people utilized uh, the, 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 those, those, those plants. And uh, for the case of secondary data, I'm thinking to be reviewing different sources, including books, articles, consultants' reports, uh, both published and uh, unpublished in, from various institutions. I would like to, to thank my supervisors, Professor Leju and uh, Professor Chazike Elizabeth, but also uh, my fund, Ageda Henkel, the Department of History and Archaeology, CHOOSE, etc. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Samuel. Samuel has uh, um, kept time to the dot, actually saved a bit of time for us. And uh, um, as uh, I, uh, we agreed, uh, we keep our questions and the comments uh, until uh, we hear from uh, Robert. Uh, Robert Semlendi, um, you have a power presentation? So, uh, Robert Semlendi uh, is uh, giving us a presentation on um, the relationship between the Sangoan Lithic typology and um, environmental characteristics at Sango Bay. Uh, uh, please, uh, in a minute or two, talk about yourself and then uh, proceed with uh, the presentation. Uh, I think I was assuming too much to not to say that uh, the presenter has 15 minutes and uh, that time is the uh, is very seriously regulated. Uh, we have a timekeeper. Uh, I was relying on the timekeeper, and uh, she's doing a very tremendous job. So let's proceed. So, um, Robert. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Protocol observed. My name is Semeland Robert from the Department of History, Archaeology, and Heritage Studies. The work I'm going to present is basically an extract from my thesis or my bigger project, situating the Sangwan Techno Complex into stone egg context 
and Sango Bay Southern Uganda, which I defended on the 17th of this month. So, making it, I think, the youngest PhD in the College of Humanities for this session. This paper is entitled The Relationship Between the Sanguan Leith Typology and Environmental Characteristics at Sango Bay, Southern Uganda. One would ask, what is the Sanguan? The Sanguan is a stone egg culture that was named after the type site Sango Bay in Uganda, way back in the 1920s by Wayland who was then a director of the Geological Survey Department in Entebbe. This Sanguan wood is an intermediate industry. Okay. The Sanguan is an intermediate industry between, within the stone egg nomenclature of the African stone egg nomenclature. What is this African stone egg nomenclature? African stone egg is the basically divided into three. That is the early stone age, middle stone age, and later stone age. Where the early stone age is subdivided into where we have the old one and the children. Ideally, the children would have for the middle stone age, but scholars working in Africa came in Eastern Africa came across cultural materials that could not feel, fit in the triplicate. And they were named uh, after the lock sites where we have Sangoan, which was named after Sango Bay. We have Njarasan in Tanzania. We have the Frithian Smith in South Africa, as well as the Chipepeto in, South, in Zimbabwe. So because of this element that we have an intermediate industry that is not so much known, and Wayland picked a surface correction, this kind of study has come across a number of controversies. But these controversies basically stem in its typology and technology, typology and environment, as far as this paper is concerned. When I talk of typology, I'll basically be referring to types of the cultural materials that are found in that particular area. In terms of typology, many scholars have defined the Sanguan as a heavy duty variant, whereas others have looked at it, like my study, which came up at Sango Bay, found that the Sanguan has a combination of both heavy and light duty tools. And what are these heavy duty tools? According to Clindest, he states that cultural materials that are above 100 millimeters are all referred to as heavy duty industries. Then on the type of, on the element of the environment where the hominids or the tool makers subsisted, many scholars have come up in different areas. The Sanguan has been discovered in, was discovered in Uganda, but has been studied globally. But with its continued controversies. In terms of the environment, scholars like Jamati, while working he states that the Sanguan is basically a grassland environment. When you look at Clark, 1965, while working in Zambia at the Colombo Falls, he states that the Sanguan is a woodland environment, basically looking at the equatorial type of climate. More so, scholars like Mark Britt, while working at Simbi in Uganda, sorry, Simbi in Kenya, looked at it as an open grassland. But Scree, 2019, and others while working in North Africa, they concur that it's an equatorial variant. Myself, from the study that was carried out in Sango Bay, the type site where this name originates from, I, it was proved that this Sangwan culture is a woodland variant. The objectives, the main objective was to establish the relationship between the Sanguan Lith typology and the environment from the type site. To achieve these two specific objectives were put on board. 
One is to look at the Sangwan typology, and the next one is to establish the relationship between the tools, uh, the, between the tools and the environment. In terms of methodology, this research used a cross-sectional design, which entailed use of archaeological, environmental, and historical sources, where data collection was done through archaeological surveys and archaeological excavation, as it's seen on the right-hand side of the slide. The topmost is a systematic survey, whereas when you move down, we have the excavation at Simba. More so, to get this information inside of environment, phytolith analysis was done. And when you talk of phytolith, these are basically, in a layman's language, plant skeletons which you find in the soils. And these ones are always kept in that particular place since they cannot be moved by water or they can't be moved by wind. The sample and sampling procedures. In terms of sampling, or the sample, I use archaeological materials from both survey and excavation. While well as the sampling procedure was basically purposive with the use of snowball method. One would ask, why do you use this kind of purposive sampling and on which group of people well knowing that the Sangwan culture existed 400,000 400, to 200,000 years and you know people are existing in that particular period of time. But what should be noted that archaeological materials are found within the environment and people who have been living in Sangobe for over 50 years were interviewed. These people were basically, have been basically interacting with the environment in which we find these cultural materials and they could easily direct me to the cultural sites they've come across. Data analysis was basically on lithic attributes and phytolith morphotypes. Why lithic phytolith? respect of the fact that the archaeological assemblage in Sango Bay had pottery, it had metal, but the study is a stone egg culture. That's why I employed the lithic. I looked at lithics, basically. In terms of results, results from Sango Bay yielded a total of 5,000, yielded a total of 3,000, 954 cultural materials, both from survey and excavation. But out of this, a pickaxe that has been looked at by different scholars globally as the hallmark of the Sangwan culture was also in abundance. Out of that figure, 100 pickaxe were picked from both survey, where survey had 44 and 56 came from excavation. And those that came from excavation could easily tell the, kind, the time when these cultural materials were in place. Basing on all this, more attributes were looked at, like the length of these cultural materials. The peak axis from Sangobe had a length of over of 113 millimeters and a thickness of 33 millimeters. This was big enough or they were long enough for be handheld and be used for any kind of artifact, for any kind of work, thereby bringing in the element of the relationship between these tools, which are the hallmark of the archaeological assemblage, to the environment. Basically, the environment has been proved through phytos, as we are going to see. Through the analysis of phytos, it was discovered that we have cultural materials, which cultural materials basically, we have cultural materials. What we have on this side, what or the left hand side, all of these indicate the presence of grasslands. From this point of the point shaped up to as far as physical growth moth, we have an indication of the woodland variant. A summary has been brought up in orange color. Where you look at this, all these are indicative of poesy or wood glassland environment, whereas the dark green color represents the woodland or the sum total 
Okay, they were just now only receiving some studies now. We are trying, like, through, through dating or chronology, but also... Uh, Dr. Edgar's question about uh, the possibilities of uh, politicization of heritage, uh, because I think uh, the topic that you are, you are tackling has uh, uh, some aspects of that. Would you like to... Yeah, but uh, me, I don't think it is a po politicization of heritage, but uh, I'm seeing it as a, a politics of knowledge. Because, uh, uh, because uh, uh, I've, in my presentation, I've just highlighted some of the scholars, when they visited that site, they linked it in another site, which is also under contradictions in terms of time. But uh, you can see maybe, these people, I don't see, I don't think if they overlooked or they did it purposely, but it is because of the politics of that particular time that uh, you cannot, because actually that period was during colonialism, and now maybe these people were are, we are trying to, 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 to think how can these people be developing, uh, because there are so many theories regarding, regarding those issues. So how, how could they develop uh, prior uh, the invention or the coming of these people who are thought to bring development. That's why they came up like uh, inferring even if the site has material that uh, looks older, older like uh, before even uh, the history. Because when we are talking of history, we mean after uh, like uh, the, the, the time after 5000 uh, BP, before present. But you, you see the material that depicts the existence of even before written history. And, and uh, it is, it, it, it is I, don't, I, I don't have a better language to put it, but you should pick it as, as it is. So sometimes it's not even politicization of heritage itself, but it is political, like knowledge politics. Uh, thank you very much. Um, do we have, uh, from the audience, any issue, uh, comment, uh, question to uh, the panelists? Uh, looks like not. Um, so I think uh, what comes uh, out of uh, uh, this panel, uh, the, the, I mean the, the presentations, what cuts across is that uh, um, uh, no branch or no aspect of knowledge should be taken that lightly or dismissed uh, um, uh, beforehand. Uh, from the questions that uh, came from the audience, you could uh, clearly see that uh, um, there are dangers that uh, we may not necessarily see uh, right away. Um, that uh, uh, contributions, but also uh, dangers that uh, uh, knowledge from archaeology can alert us about. There is, uh, um, uh, for, ex uh, for instance, uh, uh, I think all the uh, presentations, uh, all the presenters have touched on uh, human activity as it relates to the environment. And we know that um, uh, this is becoming really, really topical. And uh, uh, the take home is that uh, what we are seeing today, the, 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 the fears that we have did not begin yesterday. Uh, if you look at, uh, uh, for example, Robert's presentation, if you look at uh, Samuel's presentation, uh, these uh, have been uh, uh, cropping up. Human activity have been, um, uh, the, the, the human environmental interaction has been ongoing over the years with the uh, astounding achievements, but also uh, with the dangers uh, that we see. Uh, what uh, Dr. Uh, Edgar Taylor uh, brought out as politicization of heritage uh, which is uh, potentially uh, destabilizing, uh, has another, uh, probably sister, which is commercialization. 
I, I think uh, Tendai uh, touched on it in a body or two. Uh, so uh, when heritage is uh, uh, commercialized, we stand a danger of actually um, either silencing because commercially uh, something has an intrinsic value that is not necessarily uh, uh, immediately commoditized and then we lose it as uh, human heritage uh, and uh, uh, also over commercialization can lead to over exploitation and loss of uh, uh, heritage. Uh, with that, uh, I want you to uh, join me uh, um, in an applause for this great uh, panel as we conclude uh, um, our session. Thank you very much. <laughs>